Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. Thank you so much for the gift of today. Thank you for what you are doing, what you have done, and what you are going to do. Thank you, Almighty God, that today will be a great day for all of us as we open up our hearts to hear you speak to us. Help us, Almighty God, to hear. Help us, Almighty God, to pay attention. Help us, Almighty God, to be doers of the word and not just hear us only. Today is going to be a great day. Today is going to be a wonderful day. Today is a day that the Lord has made. We rejoice in this day and we are glad. Thank you, Almighty God, for what you are going to do among us. We thank you for it. Thank you for the edification of your people and the glorification of your name. Lord, be thou exalted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God, people of God. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice in this day and we are glad in it. Today I'm going to be talking to you about part two of the series we started last week called The 10 Practical Ways to Build Abundance into Your Life or 10 Practical Ways to Move from Scarcity Mindset to Abundance Mindset. As you will recall, towards the end of last year, the Lord began to deal with us about how to cultivate an abundance mindset. God began to explain to us why abundance is necessary because we are of God. But one of the things that um, we covered last week was that one of the ways in which we build abundance into our lives really is through the act of gratitude. We've covered, uh, today's the last day of the seven-day gratitude challenge that we've been doing where we're asking you to perform an act that shows that you are grateful for life. You are grateful for people that God has placed in your life. You are grateful for the little things that we do take for granted. So today I want to be talking about another ways in which you can build uh, abundance into your life is through the art, the act of giving. You know, being a giver, but not just a random giver, but giving from the heart. So I want to address a number of misconceptions, possibly in the body of Christ around giving, and that will help all of us, including myself, from what God has told, taught me, to be better givers. Now, I want to draw a caveat out first that um, whether you give or you don't give does not change the love of God for you. God loves you whether you give. God loves you whether you don't give. Okay, But if you look at this concept, if I ask you to Lift up your hands and you clench your fist like this, right? Suppose somebody comes to you and wants to shake your hands or wants to give you some money, but your hands are clenched like this. It is going to be impossible or nearly impossible for that person to put money in their hand, right? Because in, in, you have a clenched fist as it were so nothing can come in here okay now suppose you open up your hand your hands are open or fingers are opened and the person could put that money in there then you are able to do what you are able to receive okay what really happens from a giving point of view is that givers keep getting more because there is a principle of life that says nature abhors a vacuum nature abhors a vacuum nature hates a vacuum so if there's a vacuum in your life naturally things begin to go to fill it up and you can relate to these very well if you have a garden the garden at the back of your house for example the moment you leave your garden alone without tending it what happens the weeds start to grow up that's start to show up right so when you have a space that is a vacuum it starts to get filled up automatically. That's the way nature is. Nature does not like to have empty space that is unfilled. It begins to just fill it up. Just think about the first time you move into your house. If you move to an empty apartment, what will happen? Before you know it, you start buying this and buying that and buying that to fill everything up. It's just natural. It's just the way nature works. God has admired that nature should always produce more to fill whatever space is available. Now, because of that, if you apply that concept to giving, it means the more you give, the more you create vacuum, you know, 
for nature or for God to feel more so that you can keep getting to give more. And that's the reason why givers keep getting more. The more you give, the more you get. But I know that believers also do love to give. Uh, People give their tithes. People give their offerings. People give this and that. But the motive that is the motive the motive that drives why you give is important it's even much more important than what you give because if you give the wrong motive it will be counterproductive remember last week we spoke about gratitude done the wrong way say for example somebody is in a relationship where the person is being molested and we say oh practice gratitude the person now says oh at least i have a husband at least i have a, a wife but the guy is about to kill you and you say, oh, I'm just grateful at least that I have a husband. I'm not like somebody who doesn't have a husband or who doesn't have a wife. That is gratitude coming from a scarcity mindset. Giving also can be done from a scarcity mindset. And that's what I want to address today. How does giving build abundance into your life? How should giving be done in the right way according to the scriptures? And uh, if you find yourself having a scarcity mindset when you want to give to somebody... What approach can you take? What um, method can you adopt that will help to shift you from that scarcity mindset to gratitude mindset? I'm going to share with that, uh, to abundance mindset rather. I'm going to share with that with you today based on what the Lord taught me and based on what I apply in my own life. Praise God. Now, to start this off, I want to say something clearly that everybody is a giver. I know that might sound very funny. Everybody is a giver. Everybody is giving something one way or the other. So now, though, when we talk about giving, people try to relate giving primarily to money. But giving is not just about the money you give. You're giving your time. You're giving your advice. You're giving help to instruction. You help a lady out. You give money. There are other things you can give that's not necessarily really about being able to give money. Your time is even more important than money. If you have ever spent some time with somebody who is maybe being being bereaved and you've been there to console them, you have given your time. If you have ever given an advice to a young person that is doing something wrong to try and direct that child into the right direction, you are a giver. You, You have the ability to give. What I'm trying to draw out here is that there's nobody on the face of the earth who does not have some level of ability to give. Why? Because we are made in the image and likeness of God. Now, if you can give your time, you also can give money. If you can give money, you can give kind words. This is what I mean. Which means you are able to help somebody else on the journey of life by your advice, by your materials, by the gift of your time, by the gift of your person. So, don't let anybody browbeat you first and say, Oh, you are stingy, you are lazy. You are stingy and lazy because because in the area where you are not giving as you should, you have embraced a mindset that says it is not enough. Giving is the practice of abundance. It tells your mind, I have enough to spare that I can give these to someone else. I'll say that again. Giving says to your mind, I have more than enough to spare. Therefore, I can give this excess to somebody else. Let me give you, let me ask you to practice something. Suppose you have a hundred pounds in your account. That's all the money you have in the world. And somebody were to come to you and say, um, I need you to borrow me 20 pounds or not borrow, maybe give me 20 pounds. But you only have hundred pounds in, in the world. What will you do? Will you struggle to give that 20 pounds or not? I guess your answer could be, that shouldn't be a big deal because at least I will have 80 pounds left in the bank account. So when you are giving from abundance or you are giving from surplus, you don't feel funny about it. You are not worried about it because you know, I have some other one, I have some other stuff left. Now, suppose you have a hundred pounds and somebody comes to you and says, well, I, I have a problem and I need a hundred pounds right now to solve that problem. Imagine the kind of emotional turmoil that I may throw you into. If you don't understand, I appreciate and embrace some of the things that God is going to share with us today. You start to say, oh man, 
how am I going to feed my family tomorrow? How is that going to work? How is that going to work? Now, notice the emotion that you felt when you know that you have some left to, to spare. And the emotion you felt when you know that that's all you got. Which of these emotions will you say serve you best? The one that makes your heart to constrict and you feel you, your mouth is dry, your heart is constricted, you feel like you can't breathe properly because, oh man, that's all I've got. I don't have any money left. Or the one that feels, oh, I have more than enough. You, know, you can just take this. It's just a drop in the ocean. I would b- believe that you would choose a second one whereby as you give, you are giving from a place of abundance. And therefore, you don't have your chest constricting because you know that you have more than enough. What you are giving is just a tiny drop from what you, God has blessed you with and you have more than enough. Now, it is easier said than done to talk about these things when you do have the money, when you physically can see the cash in your bank account. But what if you don't have the cash in your bank account? How do you cultivate giving with the mindset of giving when physically there's no money in your bank account? Let's go back to the conversation I started with earlier. I said, if you have ever given an advice to somebody, you are a giver. If you have ever given um, um, you spent you know, giving your time to console someone or to spend some time with somebody, you are a giver. The problem is when it comes to money or in any area where you think you are stingy, is because you have been duped to think that that resource is not enough, and therefore, because it's not enough, or because you think it's not enough. What comes into play is what? Self-preservation. Self-preservation comes into play because now you want to preserve yourself. You want to preserve your life. You know, and the, 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 the idea behind self-preservation is a natural thing for every human being. Everyone we always want to preserve themselves first before they can take care of anybody else. So there's nothing wrong with that feeling of self-preservation. When it becomes a problem is when it then controls your life so much that it stops things flowing into your life. Now, let's look at something. Imagine you are on your way to work and you're driving, you're enjoying yourself, you're having fun. And you met, you saw someone on the side of the road who is about to jump off a cliff. At that point in time, you slam on the brakes, park the car, you ran towards this person because what was utmost in your mind was to save that person's life. At that point in time, you find yourself, be, you began to speak to this person words that would encourage a person, that would dissuade the person's mind from committing this atrocious suicidal act. At that point in time, what are you giving? Are you giving money? Or are you giving time? Are you giving advice? I would say you're giving your time and you're giving your advice. Now, question. Was that advice or the instruction you were giving to that person, was it solicited or not? The answer is, it was not solicited. It was an act that you had in your heart based on the fact that you saw somebody who was about to fall off the cliff and you ran to that person to try and save that person. That is a natural desire for being a human being. The reason why I brought this up is because I want to just reiterate the fact that giving to somebody who is in need is a choice you make. It is not something that you cannot do. It's a choice you make based on the fact that you have looked at the options you have and said, this is not of value, this is of value. If you have to choose between giving an advice to someone and giving money, like this person on the ledge who's about to fall off the ledge, who's about to jump off the ledge, and you say, oh, in this instance, this person will not need money. What they need is something that will preserve their life. Therefore, I'm going to give them advice or instruction on how to get them off. At that instance, in light of what has happened there, you have judged instruction and the time that you spend with that person of more value than money. At that point in time, money... It's not something that you are paying attention to because it's of no value at all. At that, at that point in time, you have valued your time and you value the instruction you've given to this person of more value than money. So from this example, you will notice, therefore, is this. 
at any situation where you find yourself, whether somebody needs money from you, somebody it, your time, somebody needs your advice, it is the value that you place on that resource that you're sharing with that person that will determine whether you want to give more of it out or you want to withhold it. Now, remember what we spoke about in some of the other videos. We spoke about the hoarding spirit. We say that when you hoard something, you are working in scarcity mode. Every time you are hoarding something like you don't want to let go of something that you use in your hand, it's because you think you will never get more of it to come again. You feel that when you give this thing out, the only thing you've got left, how in the world am I going to protect myself? How in the world am I going to take care of myself? And the Lord began to show me how to cultivate abundance mindset by knowing fully where that we are connected to a source that never runs dry. In the book of Mark, uh, Psalm 23, verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd who feeds. The Lord is my shepherd who guides. The Lord is my shepherd who shields, and I shall not lack. In another translation, he says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I want. The Passion Translation renders it this way. It says, Yahweh is my best friend. And my shepherd, I always have more than enough. So this person is speaking that he or she always have what? More than enough. So the more than enough that he has is not just about money. It's about I have more than enough in every area. I I I, I have everything I want. If I want something, it's always there. How why is that? The answer is because the Lord is my shepherd. Now, the word shepherd in this Psalm 23, verse 1, is the word is, is from the Hebrew word Ra. And it means the Lord is my best friend. The Lord is my special friend. So, what essentially this scripture is saying, if you know that God is your special friend, if you know that God is your wonderful friend, right, then you can know that you always have more than enough. A couple of days ago, we were watching uh, Sky News and they had this uh, advert rolls that are moving between segment to segment. And I saw the, the, the map of the world rolling and rolling and they were showing different parts of the world with the, with the current temperature in each of these areas. And I began to look at that. Then my wife said something that I found quite profound. She said, oh, this map clearly shows that the earth is more of water than land. That the world is more of water than land. Now you can see that, you know, this all the, the, the blue element on, on the globe is much more than the areas where you have land mass. And as I began to think about that, you know, I said something to in my heart. I said, This shows to me that there are other places in this world that we have not been. You know, there are a whole lot of places that we've not been. There are places in this world that if you get dropped there, nobody will ever find you. That's how big this world is. And as I began to point out, I said, as big as this world is, that God has created this wonderful big world, that we cannot even transverse the extent of the earth. Nobody on the face of the earth knows every single inch of the ground on this earth. You might say, oh, I've traveled around the world, but you don't know everywhere in the world. There are places in this world that if, you, if they drop you in there, nobody will find you. But God sees everything. Now, as I began to ponder that, you know the thought that came to my mind? As big as our earth is, that we cannot transverse the whole length of it. And as big as the earth is, so much so that 80% of it is covered in water. Do you know there are other planets that are bigger, bigger, far, far bigger than the earth, of which the earth, compared to them, is so small in comparison? Now, I began to think about the fact that if you cannot transverse the earth, you don't even know every part of the earth, with all the knowledge that we've acquired over the years... How about all these other universes and galaxies that we cannot transfer it? And as I began to think about it, I began to think about, but compared to God, these big universes that are bigger, these stars or universes that are bigger than the earth are actually smaller compared to God, which means God is far, far bigger than all of the universes combined together, far, far mightier than, than the earth combined together. And as I began to think about it, I began to think about the enormity and the bigness of this God who created, who created the heavens and the earth. And as I began to think about that, you know what came to my mind? And I said, if this God who created the heavens and the earth, who, cre who created the earth, that we, we cannot transfer the full length of it, if this God says to you, I am going to take care of you, why will you struggle to believe that he can do that? That was the thought that was coming to my mind. Essentially, God essentially is saying, if you understand how big I am, how my hands are more than enough to, and capable to do anything in this life that you that you desire, even the things that you have not even thought about, God is able to do them. How much, how, how can it be difficult, therefore, to believe that things are running out of uh, things are running out on us? How can it be difficult to believe this God 
who is bigger than the greatest dreams that we can ever have whose hands are not limited to make things happen for us in this life how can it be so difficult to believe god and i have some answers that god shared with me the reason why it's difficult is because of experiences at times we have some nasty experiences where god didn't come through or where it seemed like as if god didn't come through at times we have been schooled in the language of the world so much so that when god says something to us we struggle to believe it because now we are drawn more by what we see with the senses. And so, because God is so big and is so mighty and wonderful and he can do all things, he said to you in Psalm 23 verse 1, I am your shepherd. The word shepherd means I will take care of you. The word shepherd means the one who goes ahead of you to prepare the way. The word shepherd means the one who watches over you. Lord God says, I am your shepherd. I will feed you. I will guide you. I will shield you. And because I will do this, you shall not lack any good thing. Amen? God says, I am your shepherd. He is your best friend and is giving you his word that, that says, I will take care of you. Now, if you embrace this mindset that God will take care of you, then it becomes easy to give. It becomes easy to give of your time. It becomes easy to give of your resources. It becomes easy to give of your instruction. It becomes easy to even share things with other people that might seem as if you are in the same competitive speed, space. Why? Because God will take care of you. Giving is a practice of abundance. It tells your mind, I have enough to spare that I can give to someone else. So whether you are giving a generous gift, you are giving or you are donating to a cause or you are taking care of somebody that you care about or you are bringing cookies to a, 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 an older person who cannot cook by himself or herself. No, the giving, therefore, over, helps you to override this mindset of scarcity that says it is not enough. It helps you to override the mindset that says I need to hoard because it's not enough in the world. One of the ways in which we have embraced scarcity mindset in our world today is through the whole idea that is being perpetrated about about about, um, about climate change. Now, please, before you start to shoot me down, I am one hundred percent in support that we need to take care of our environment. I'm one hundred percent in support of the fact that we are responsible for this earth. We need to take care of it. But every time somebody makes you to think that those world will run out of resources, they are unconsciously planting scarcity mindset in you. Every time you think, oh, at the rate we're going, there will not be enough left. They are planting at the subconscious level a scarcity mindset that says it is not enough. I was telling my children the other day, I was saying, the reason, actually, it was two, yesterday, I was saying, the reason why competition has this, has a problem when you when you get into competitive spirit why is a problem is because it's almost like you are competing for the little that is on ground but god has more than enough resources god has unlimited resources where you can tap into that it, you can never plumb the depth of of the love of god plumb the depth of the resources that god has placed on this earth I don't know if this is making sense. So, so when somebody says to you, "Oh, let's 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 run around and grab all you can grab because it's my run out of fashion," is because they are planting in your mind that the resources in this world is not enough, and that's why you find wars break out, fights break out because people think if I don't do something about it, everybody's going to take everything that's left. I will have nothing left. But have you noticed that the more the the the, the more we, they dredge the oil in certain places, the more go, the, the more they keep finding oil deposits in other places. Why? God placed them there. God placed them there because he knew that we we're going to need them. And he will never stop supplying because that's who God is. God is the unlimited source of supply. Say with me, the Lord is my unlimited source of supply that never runs dry. Say with me, my prosperity is as far reaching as the universe. Amen. Praise God. So, if you have an entrenched, scarcity mindset because you have listened to the world system so much, being generous feels like a virtue that is very hard to access. Why is it easy for some to be generous? For example, my wife is a very generous person. It's far, far easier for us to be generous to somebody than some people, right? Okay, why is it easier for some to be generous? And some struggle with it. Well, I have an answer. The answer could be, when you were growing up, you may have experienced such a scarcity, um, an environment leading with scarcity, 
that it, it becomes a problem for you in your mind that you say, I do not want that to ever happen to me again. If you have grown up in a place where you had to struggle to, to eat three square meals, you could tell yourself a story while you were growing up as a young child because you, could, you didn't have enough. They said, oh, I don't want to ever get to that position again. Then what do you do? You hold on tight to what you have. And by holding on tight to what you have, you are not what letting go. You become like a lake that is just taking a lake or a pond that is just taking in the, the, the information, but you're not letting it go. And because you're not letting it go, you're not allowing fresh water to come into your hand to be able to allow it to bless other people. You have become somebody who has, be, has become a clenched fist, as it were, instead of it to be the open palm. Does that make sense? So because of this experience of the past, we build stories in our mind about, oh, that has happened to me. I don't want that to ever happen to me again. It's also like somebody who is being in a relationship and got jilted. Maybe the person got jilted in a relationship that is that was meant to lead to marriage, but you know, maybe the guy messed up or the, the lady messed up. And all of a sudden now, you are afraid to try something new. You are afraid to allow what? Fresh water, fresh person to come into your life because of the experience you've had in the past. And because of that, because you are setting up these guardrails in your mind to protect yourself, what happens? You are not allowing the opportunity for something new to come in there. Now, the way you feel is natural. Remember, I said, if you have a hundred pounds, as somebody asks you for that hundred pounds, you know, and that's all you've got for your family, the natural, the first thing that will come to your mind as a responsible human being is, so how am I going to feed my family? If I give this hundred pounds to this person, how am I going to feed my family? And one of the things that the Lord shared with me as I, as I deep dive in here will help us to see some of the things that you can do when you even find yourself in that situation to help you to be able to give to somebody else even when it is inconvenient for you. Now, this is something that the Lord is working on me about as I talk about this. As he's, working, he's, he's probably going to be working on you as you are listening to this. But what I want us to become is to be more of a church that gives and gives and gives and gives to people knowing fully well what that God is our source. When we hoard anything, it is because we are trying to fill this hole that has been left behind by what we didn't have access to based on the experiences we've had in the past. So, how do we begin to break free from the scarcity mindset through the act of giving? You can give in small bits. Let's say somebody comes to you and say they need a hundred pounds and you cannot give that hundred pounds because you say, Oh, I'm gonna have I'm gonna be helpless. You can give it 20 quid, you can give it 30 quid, you can give something that you can that you feel you are happy to give instead of saying, I cannot give you anything at all. When you give, no matter how small it is, with a motivation of love, you are building the capacity to become a giver. It's somebody who likes to give more and more. Now why do we need to give? Why is it important to give? Number one, giving is a command that God himself calls out. God says, now look at this. In this Luke chapter 6, verse 38, this is what God said. God said, give. Now, remember, it can be giving of an advice. It can be time. It can be money. It can be your clothes. Right? God says, give and it shall be given to you. The word shall is a most um, strong word in the English language. And I got to know this when I was doing some, I was doing some consulting work in Kenya and was stuck up in this uh, board, board room with some of these lawyers and they began to pull out the contract that was signed with the customer and they began to tell me about the meaning of must and shall and will and what it means in the court of law. And that's when I knew the word shall is a most strong statement that gives you an assurance that if you do what is on the left, what is on the right is going to happen. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Whatever you give shall be given unto you. Now, this statement is a double-edged sword because what you give, even if you give malice, you are going to get malice back. If you give joy, you give joy back. If you give peace, you're going to get peace back. If you give acrimony, you will get acrimony back. If you give envy, you are going to get it back. It's a law. It's a law. Now, li- listen. Give and it shall be given to you. It's not a Christian law. This is a spiritual law. It's a spiritual law that those who understand giving take advantage of it. You have heard of people 
who are in the world as it were who understand this principle and the more they give the more they get mr mr b gates gives he, he, him and his wife before they before they got divorced you know they have this the foundation that they used to give money to a lot of people they used to give to charity and have you seen his his, uh, his worth diminish no giving is a spiritual principle it's not just a christian principle it's a spiritual principle that if we tap into it the more we give the more we get god just christ is essentially saying here give and it shall be given what you give you are going to get it back but now look at what happens look at what happens good measure press down shaking together and what running over god essentially is saying when you give not only will you get what you gave out back coming to you but it will not come in the same quantity it will come much more than you have given it will come much more than you are given. It will come in good measure. Good measure means it will fill up what you already uh, what you have given. Then it will press more down to fill up any any loose any any holes or any vacancy or any any open space in 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 your pocket or in your life, right? And then it will put it all together, and then you begin to run over. God essentially says, when you make giving a lifestyle you are going to have so much abundance that not only will it satisfy your need, it will flow over to other people. This exactly is what God said in John chapter 10 verse 10, right? I am come that you may have life and have that life to the full or have the life until it overflows to other people. Praise God forevermore. So give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, press down, shaking together and running over. Now, how is it going to come? God says, shall men give into your bosom. God essentially says, when you give out, in whatever form, whether it is advice, time, money, and clothes, or whatever it is, when you give that out, God will cause other people to bring of that same thing to you and more back to you. That's essentially what Jesus Christ said. He said, it shall be given back to you. He now says, for with the same measure that you met with her, it shall be measured to you again. He says, the same way, the same measure, the same packaging in which you have given out, that is the same way it's going to come back to you. So, if I give um, uh, uh, the gift of love, it will come back to me. Gift of love. If I give the gift of hatred, it shall come back to me. Gift of hatred. So now you might be here. You might be thinking, do an assessment of your life. Say, what am I? Have I been given out? What have I received in return? Suppose you have been given out something of a genuine heart, but check your heart. If your heart is not right with the gifts, then because god looks in the heart it is what is in your heart that comes back to you not just what you use your mouth to say so god says to give and to keep getting more comes from what you give you will get more of it press down shaking together and running over that's number one why we give giving is a command because a give and you're going to get back number two we give because it helps us to emulate god Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1. The Bible says, Emulate God as dear children of God. Copy him. Look at what he does and do the same thing. Now, we know that God is a giving God. How do we know? The Bible says, For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave. God not, did not only pay lip service to his love. God backed up his love by the act of giving. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God here say, he shows us in, here in John 3, 16, that the way you demonstrate love is by giving. Giving based on love should therefore be what? The motivation when we give of our time advice money clothes let us give based on the motivation of what of love if somebody comes to you and say they need an advice make sure you give that advice from the basis of love why is that because god says anything that is not done in love is useless it's wasted it's not counted first Corinthians chapter 13 verse 3 you know that most wonderful scripture that talks about agape love the Bible essentially says, and though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, I take all my goods, everything in my house, I go and sell it off and I give it to the poor. And I give my body to be burnt. I take my body and say, look, 
put me on the stake and burn me up to save these people. The Bible says, if I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Obviously, this is a very um, graphic statement that's explaining the enormity of what is trying to talk about of the power of love above everything else. Now, here is the thing. The same way I told you in the beginning that you are a giver because you are made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, if you have ever given an advice to somebody before, you have ever given money to somebody before, you've given your time to somebody before, it means you have the capacity to give. The reason why you are not giving in the area where you may be struggling or I may be struggling in the area, in a particular area of giving is because I have run that thing higher than the supply of God. I have thought to myself that there's not enough. Therefore, I better hold on to what I have. And God essentially is saying, if you take all your goods, which is a good thing, I say, let's sell it off and go and feed the poor. And I give my body to be burnt. If it is not coming from a place of love, then it does not profit me anything. So therefore, the motivation behind your gift is more important than your gift. I want you to write that down. The motivation behind your gift is more important than your gift. The reason you give is more important than what or how much you give. Let's write that down. The reason you give, the motivation behind what you give, you gave, all right, is more important than what you give and how much you give. So, in light of that basis then, let me now tell you something. I've got 10 minutes left. Any presentation that says to you, you can buy the blessing of God or the salvation of a loved one or some other possible result in your life with financial gift is a scam. It's a scam because that person has given you the wrong motive to give. Giving should be giving should be based on what on the love. If somebody says, "Oh, the move of God is moving now," pay five thousand dollars, and then God is, and then after you do that, then God is going to bless you. That person has just scammed you. God does not need you to do anything before He blesses you. But remember, I said giving is a spiritual is a spiritual law that those who do it get more into their life. Not because they are doing it to manipulate God. It's a spiritual law. It's like, if I open up my hand, more is placed in there. If I close my hand, nothing can come in there. Do you see what I mean? It's essentially making myself presentable for the laws of the universe to work in my favor. So when you give, give with a mindset that says, I love this person, I want to give. Don't give, don't let anybody would wink you and say, oh, if you don't give X, Y, and Z, then God is not going to bless you. I got to ask you a question. What did you give before Christ came to die for you? Now, remember, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, I believe. God has blessed us. Now, how did God bless us? He blessed us because we're in Jesus Christ. What did we do for God to bless us? Nothing. God blessed us. God bestowed his blessing upon us without us praying long prayer, without us fasting, without us even thinking that we needed the blessing. The blessing of God upon our lives preceded our, our need of it. So we didn't work to get blessed. The blessing of God just came upon us because we gave our lives to Jesus. Therefore, you cannot, you cannot pay for the blessing of God. You cannot say, oh, because I prayed 55 hours, because I fasted 100 days, that's why God now is not moving my life. No. Those things are necessary spiritual exercises that we must do. We must pray and fast and all that kind of stuff. That is to help us to believe God for what he has already done. God already moved on our behalf before we even thought we need it and therefore what we do with all the exercises we do like the prayers and the fasting is to help our own heart to believe that god has already done it so that we can take advantage of what god has done god is a source of all gift god is a source of all gift Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18 the bible says but you shall remember the lord your god for it is he that gives you the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which is where unto your fathers at this day so here we see god is the giver of all gift if you therefore you have the mindset that god is a giver of the breath that i breathe without the breath that i breathe i cannot even walk i cannot even do all the things that i'm doing therefore god deserves it now remember this is not a law. God is not demanding it. God essentially is saying to you, when you give, you get more. Because a lake that is not flowing anywhere cannot get fresh water in it. 
a hand that is closed, a, a, a fist that is closed like this, a, a fist, a, a closed hand that's like a fist cannot get anything put in there. But it's a river, a stream that is flowing into other places. We always have fresh water flowing in. A hand that is open to help other people, we always have more to be placed in there. Does that make sense? So the, the reason why you give is important. Now, Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 to 8 says that you must not allow anybody to compel you to give. Giving must be as you proposed in your heart. The Bible says, Every man according as he proposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Don't, don't give from the mindset that if you don't give, you are going to be thrown out of the church. If you don't give, um, you will not get access to certain benefits. Or if you don't give, uh, God is going to take it out on you uh, in, in sicknesses because some people preach that. You know, that's all sort of nonsense, nonsense, nonsense conversation. You know, if you don't give, God is going to do this, God is going to do that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Will you do that to your own child? If your child, and this example that I've given before, I said, if your child go, let's say your child, you know, um, you've sent all this money sending your child to school. Your child, you know, uh, is not in, uh, uh, just finished university, started working, let's say, at um, some nice bank, getting paid 100000 a year. Yeah. And your child has told you, ah, mommy, you know what? When I start working, my first salary, I'm going to give it to you. Just to thank you for everything you've done for me. Yeah. Now, suppose that child now starts work, started working. Didn't honor that promise. Now, remember, you did not ask the child to give you that money. She decided to give you that money of her own volition. Yeah. Now, the child didn't honor that commitment for whatever reason. Maybe the child is trying to settle down, trying to, you know, set up his apartment and so on and so forth. You now said to yourself, this child, I have to teach this child a lesson. Because this child did not honor his commitment. I'm going to teach this child. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set some boils to break out on his body. I'm going to take, tell him to have uh, some sort of uh, asthmatic attack. Or I'm going to try and cause some problems to come to this child. Or I'm going to get him to get fired. You know, that way the boy will remember and know that he ought to give me what he said he was going to give me. I'm 100% sure that you will not do that to your own child. So why do we therefore put these things on God that we cannot do to our own children? You know what we're doing? We're essentially saying we are more righteous than God. But what did God say? God said in the book of Luke chapter 11, God says, If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Or how much more will God give good things, another translation says, to them that ask him? So, God is saying, if you will not treat your child in a nasty way, you will not give your child a snake when your child asks for egg. You will not give your child a scorpion when your child asks for bread. If you will not treat your child that way, at least you can expect that God will not treat you that way. That's essentially what he's saying. So, our motive for giving is very important. Our motive for giving is very important. And that verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you. God is the one who is able to make all grace to abound towards you so that all, you will always have all sufficiency in all things and you may abound to every good work. I was essentially saying, try and have this mindset that God is going to make all grace to abound towards you so that you will always have sufficiency in all things. Now, you see, a bonus mindset. God essentially says, when it's time for you to give and you feel, oh man, I can't give. There's no money. God says, shift your attention to this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 to 8 and say, God is making all grace to abound towards me now. I have I always have all sufficiency in everything in the name of Jesus Christ. I abound to every good work. Say that to yourself over and over and over. The more you say that, remember, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you say that, the more it creates this image of abundance in your heart. And the more you say that, the more it creates this image of abundance in your heart. After a while, when somebody comes and asks you for a hundred pounds, and it might even be that, or that's all you have, you are going to give because you know that God is going to make all grace abound towards you. Amen? I hope that makes, that's making sense. All right. But please, it's a process. After this message, you might have one that says, okay, you know, maybe it's 40 pounds you can give. It's okay. But remember, give as you propose in your heart. Do not let anybody to compel you and put you under pressure. And that says, if you don't do this, God will not do this in your life. You, The blessing of God cannot be bought. Now, there's a story 
because of time the story about how elijah got fed you can go back and read that by yourself in first Kings chapter 17 verse verses 7 to 16 i'm not going to call it out but in that story the bible says that god sent a, a elijah to a woman of zarephath that elijah should be fed by this woman but something happened i want to I want to show you something here now the bible says in verse 9 actually suffer verse 9 god said to elijah elijah arise get thee to zarephath which belong to Zidon, and dwell there. Now, look at the next word. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to sustain thee. God gave instruction to the widow to sustain Elijah. And the Bible says, when Elijah got there, Elijah says to the woman, when Elijah saw the woman, I don't know how Elijah knew the woman. Obviously, God must have told him where to go and which house to go and all that. And when, when she sees the woman, God will have told him, Elijah, that's the woman. Elijah goes to meet the woman and say, hey, by the way, fetch me i pray you a little water in a vessel that i may drink and as she was going to fetch it elijah said to her bring me i pray you a morsel of bread in in your hand now remember this woman said god has already told me to take care of this elijah god no god told elijah that he had already told the woman to take care of elijah right okay so the woman was going to take get the 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 water that elijah needed Elijah, no i said actually that's not enough give me food the woman said look as sure as, your, as, as the Lord your God lives, I, I don't have any cake. I have a handful of meal in a barrel and a little hoy in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering these sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. She said that's all she's got left in the world. That she just want to prepare it and, and eat it and she will die. The reason for that is because during this period, there has been famine in the, in the land for three years where even mothers began to eat their own children as food so this woman said look i just want to have this whatever elijah says to her do not be afraid do as you are told right and make me this cake first and bring on to me right and after that make for yourself and for your son because this is what god said god said the barrier of meal shall not waste neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the lord sends rain upon the earth and that's exactly what happened. God took that little one. Now, this is where I'm going as a roundup. God took that little oil and the little meal that she's got. And as she began to prepare it, based on listening to the instruction of God, that God says, give to this thing, God began to make it to multiply. God took that thing for three years. The small meal and the small oil sustained them for three years. The question you will ask in the logical, in the natural is, how is that possible? It is possible by the God who made the heavens and the earth. This story is a type of it is repeated in, in 2 Kings chapter 4. Actually, I preached a message some weeks back called Sell Off, Pay Off and uh, Live On, which was a story about a woman that was in debt and she didn't have anything. And the man of God said, what do you have in your house? Because the, the, the debtors have come, the creditors have come to collect uh, 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 our sons to sell off because to pay off the debt of the husband and she said i only have this uh, this small oil and the man said go and borrow more jugs and more vessels i begin to pour this small oil you have in this vessel and as she began to pour she kept on pouring and the more vessels she got the more oil she got the more vessels she got the more oil she got until one time she asked the son the son where is the, give me another vessel the son said there's no there are no more vessels and the oil stopped and the man of god said take this oil that you now have Go and sell it, pay off your debt, and live on the rest. The question again you ask is, how is it possible that one small oil will just keep producing, producing to feed a, a lot of vessels of of, the, of oil? How is that possible? Because one thing with God, the small thing you have in your hand, is more than enough for God to bless you. One day, God said to me, God said to me, "Do not ever think in the context of a fixed income. Don't think." in your life about this is the fixed income that i have because god says to me the moment you start to have a fixed income you have capped how much money i can flow into your life have this master that says god is able to do exceedingly abundantly above what i ask or think or imagine and now if you know that there's no limit to where your source is coming from then you can dream big then you can be generous then you can help other people now when this thought comes to me like maybe i want to give somebody money all of a sudden, I start feeling, oh man, this is, I don't have enough money. Let me tell you what I do, what God is supposed to teach me that I do. God says, always give from the place of abundance. So, when you start to feel funny about giving, visualize abundance. And then give from that. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Visualize abundance. So how do I do that? Like this story I gave you in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, you can go back and read it. How did the oil multiply? Because that oil is connected to a source in the realm of the spirit that keeps producing. The oil is not based on physical thing that you can see. The same way with the woman that, that fed Elijah, the meal and the oil. Why did he keep producing for the next three years? Because it's connected to a source that is in the realm of the spirit that your physical eyes cannot see that never runs dry. The same way, God says now, therefore, when you want to give and you start to feel like there's no money, close your eyes and visualize abundance. See yourself having more than enough that you are connected to the heavenly source that never runs dry. And then when you have that sense of abundance in your mind, then give from that place. So you are not giving from abundance, you are not giving from scarcity. I hope that that is blessed somebody, right? Because that is what I, I began to use in my life. That even recently, when I need to give somebody send some money to Nigeria, I think, oh man, there's no money. I go say no from abundance. Speak from abundance. So I close my eyes, visualize more and more coming to me, and then I was I'm able to give from that. The last point I want to raise it raises this: be a good receiver. Now, there's a scripture in Acts chapter twenty verse thirty five that says, "I have shown you all things how that." So laboring, you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but I will just say, tell you something. It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's point number one. God says, the more you give, the more you draw into your life. But you know, it, it did not say, it is more blessed to give and it is not blessed to receive. How, you know, that's not what he said. He said, it is more blessed to give than to give that to receive. Which means he's saying, there is a blessing attached to giving. There is an equal blessing attached to receiving. It's just that one in the hierarchy of the kingdom is more than the other. Giving is a spiritual gift. Now, here's a question. Suppose you are not, you don't want to receive at all. How will the person who wants to give be able to give to somebody? If everybody says, I don't want to receive, I don't want to receive, I just want to be giving, I, don't, I just want to be giving, I don't want to receive. Then there will not be anybody to receive that gift. Then the person who is who, is, who desires to give, that cannot have a, somebody to give to, then gets frustrated. Then the person cannot then have these open hands that more flows into. So you need to be good at receiving. Another way to appreciate giving is to be a great receiver. In order to be there, in order to, for there to be a giver, remember there must be a receiver. So if you are not great at receiving, somebody wants to give you something, say, ah, please leave it, I don't want it. That means you are not good at giving. If somebody wants to give you something and you all the time they want to, want to give you something, you just push it away, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. That means you are not good at giving. The, 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 what shows that you are a good giver is also the excitement and joy that you used to receive when somebody gives you something. And now, as I round up, I will just tell you a short story. You know, I like talking about things that have happened to me so you know that what I'm teaching you is exactly the same thing that God is dealing with me. You know, I'm not putting, setting myself up as on a high store. So we're coming from Madeira during, just before Christmas and we're in this airplane. And um, um, the lady brought... Um, um, so in the business class that we, we stayed, we, we were traveling in. The lady brought this. Um, they were they were serving food, and what we wanted, they didn't get. It seemed like everything that we wanted was ran out, ran out. And this lady came and brought this box of chocolate just to give to me and say, "Hey, you know, sorry, we couldn't give you everything we want." Now, I didn't. I, I'm trying to stay away from chocolate and stuff like that. I didn't want to take it. I just said, "Oh, you know, I just." I, just, I said, "Take it, take it, take it." In my head, I'm thinking, "Why do I want to take this chocolate?" And I eventually, I took it. All right, I said, Oh, t- thank you, but I did I don't think I said thank you very well, you know, at least so I was told. Mama told me later and said, Why didn't you want to give it? That if somebody is giving you something to just show you that they care about you and that they want to, um, just you know, compensate you for not giving you the kind of food that you wanted, you should be excited to receive it, even if you even, even if you don't want to eat the chocolate, you should make them feel good that they're able to give something to somebody and that person is happy to receive it. And that's a lesson I learned there. Learn to be a good receiver. So when somebody gives you something, receive it with joy. Be happy about it. Because if that person has gone out of their way to give you something, you don't deserve, you, you, you didn't walk into their, you didn't work for them. They didn't work for you. You know, they're not working for you. If they give, therefore give you anything, see it as a gift and be thankful for it. Be genuinely grateful for the gift that you have received. So as you become a good receiver, you are also drawing abundance into your life. As you become a better giver, you are drawing abundance into your life. Now, remember, none of this thing that I have said 
just for the record, none of these things that I have said, none of these things that I have said right now limits or impede or reduce the love of God for you. Whether you give or you don't give, whether you receive or you don't receive, God's love for you will still be on you. God's blessing is still going to be pouring into your life. What we're talking about here is how you take advantage of what is already yours. You know, you take advantage of what is already yours and experience this kingdom by being a better giver, by being a better receiver. Amen. And as you do that, the Lord who has already opened the floodgates of heaven over your life will cause you to swim in the abundance which he has surrounded, surrounded your life with in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are somebody who, who has been given and people don't appreciate you for giving, don't worry. The Bible says, give and give us unto the Lord. He that gives is given unto the Lord. Hallelujah. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 2, under the old covenant, when God wanted to build the, the tabernacle, you know what he said? He said, speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that give it willingly with his heart. He shall take my offering. God essentially said, in the, under the old covenant, that when God went to build his temple, God says, it is only those who give, who give from a willing heart that God says you should collect from. God does not want you to give a gift that you feel forced to give or you give out of fear. You give because you don't want to go to hell or you do, or don't want to... Uh, um, uh, what's, what's the right word they use? The word they use, um, devour to come out upon you. God doesn't want you to give from a, from a place of fear or from a place of scarcity. He wants to give from a place of what? Abundance. And how do you do that? Visualize that your life is already surrounded by the abundance of God. And as you do that, the Lord begin to, you know, you know, cause you to walk in that which is already yours. Remember, this is already yours. It's about you taking advantage of what's already yours in Christ. Praise God forevermore. I hope that's been a blessing to you. Thank you very much for being part of today's um, today's teaching. I hope it's been a blessing. Uh, please, um, there's a fundraising going on in church um, for uh, Adenike Sh- Sharon. The guys will put it on the screen. Uh, she's uh, believing God to go to India for surgery by the end of this month uh, so we're trying to raise thirty thousand i think thirty thousand dollars you know we have raised a, some money already um in uh, on gold fund me so please if you like to give uh you see the link on the screen please do give to that as you are like remember god loves a cheerful giver don't give out of compulsion give what you have proposed in your heart what you want to give and the lord bless your giving in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for your children and I thank you, Almighty God, as you have taught us today to become better givers. Lord, I thank you, Almighty God, that we will learn from you, we will act like you acted and we will bring more, we will draw more abundance into our lives. Help us to know, Almighty God, that we already have more than enough so we can give to other people. We give of our time, of our resources, of our money, of our knowledge, of our, of, our, of, 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 um, of everything that we have that somebody might need to move forward. We thank you that we're able to give this in abundance we're not holding them because we have more than enough we thank you for it and we give you praise in jesus name we pray amen 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 god bless you and i'll speak to you next 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 week remember you are blessed and highly favored